Broken rides, hotel issues, crowds, and eBay sellers? We're talking about the big problems you might encounter in Disney World and how to avoid them. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. So Disney World might seem like a magical place filled with goosebump-worthy shows, state-of-the-art rides, super tasty snacks, and it is. But it's by no means a perfect vacation destination. Some of its biggest flaws as of late could end up disrupting that picture-perfect trip that you've oh so carefully constructed inside your brain. So in order to make sure you can still pull off one of your best family vacations to date, we've got to expose Disney's dirty little secrets and attack them head on. That way, you won't be completely thrown off guard by the issues Disney has yet to change. If they change them, that is. First up is too many broken rides. What do you do when the ride you've been looking forward to most suddenly breaks down and unexpectedly at that? Disney rides don't run on solely pixie dust and magic all day long. Technical difficulties do happen all the time across each of the Disney World rides, with some happening way more frequently than others. Looking at you, Rise of the Resistance. Our friends over at All Ears figured out the top three rides that broke down the most in 2022. I'll be interested to see if any of these rides shocked you or if you saw them coming. In third place, we got the Tomorrowland Transit Authority People Mover in Magic Kingdom, which broke down 532 times over 264 days. In second place, we've got Test Track in Epcot, which closed 560 times over 303 days this year. And the winner for the ride with the most breakdowns for 2022 goes to, of course, Rise of the Resistance in Disney's Hollywood Studios. Rise of the Resistance experienced 580 breakdowns over 302 days. Ouch. But then again, that makes sense. Rise is one of the most popular, newest, and most high-tech attractions across all four parks, and really across all the Disney parks around the world. And the amount of demand, as well as having to rely on every advanced moving part in order to pull off this whole experience, I believe there's 27 fail points there, can be a whole lot of pressure for just one ride. But excuses or not, it's still incredibly disappointing to walk into Hollywood Studios and see the hottest attraction in Disney World down for the count, or any other ride ride at any other park for that matter that you're excited about. Now, notice how I mentioned these rides might have went down but didn't necessarily stay down. Even when you see a ride is temporarily unavailable on your My Disney Experience app, don't lose hope just yet. Many times rides will go back online after some tinkering is done, or in the case of Test Track, which goes down often because of inclement weather, you just gotta wait out the storm and come back later when the sun's shining again. So here's what you need to do. Try prioritizing your must-do rides at the beginning of the day, right after rope drop or when you use your early theme park entry, which as you know, say it with me, let's guests who are staying in a Disney-owned resort enter the parks 30 minutes before everybody else. That way, if the ride goes down earlier, you'll still have a chance to get back on later in the day when it's running again. Also, the earlier you go, the more likely that ride's gonna stay online because they just checked it and it hasn't had time to break yet. Now, just keep an eye on your My Disney Experience app digital map so you can know as soon as a ride goes back online, as soon as that little star is gone and it has a wait time, then you know it's back online. If you're already in the ride's general vicinity when it's back in business, awesome. Jump in the queue ASAP and get ahead of the crowds. Oh, and another reason why you want to prioritize your favorite rides earlier in the day, especially if they're outdoor rides or have any outdoor components, is that if there's going to be a massive rainstorm in Disney World, it's probably going to be in the afternoon. That tends to be when those come through. So that's another good reason to get on that really, really popular ride first thing in the morning. Now, if a ride goes down and you're not in the general vicinity when it comes back online, it may be a better choice to grab a lightning lane for the ride if you purchase Genie Plus that day. Because a lot of people are going to get in line for that ride real fast and the line can get very long very quickly. Or you can wait to get in the line later on after the initial hype of it coming back online dies down. Those waits maybe won't be at their very peak. Now don't you wish you could be in two places at once? You might really be wishing for a clone when you come across this Disney World dilemma. When it comes to Disney's dining reservations, you typically need to book your table 60 days in advance to secure your spot. You don't have to, but we always recommend it. We're gonna talk more about this later on. But when it comes to booking your lightning lanes through Disney Genie Plus, so you can bypass the main queues for your priority rides, you're gonna be selecting those reservations the day of your visit. Now, here's where the problem comes into play, because you're not able to book your lightning lanes in advance like you can with restaurants, there's a possibility that the next available lightning lane return time, which you have to take, is going to directly clash with your dining reservation. So which do you prioritize? The quick and easy answer? 
your dining reservation. Always your dining reservation. You see, dining reservations will give you a bit of wiggle room if you're running late, like 15 minutes top, so I wouldn't push it that far. But if it's any later than that, you not only run the risk of losing your reservation, but also being charged a $10 per person no-show fee, a fate I have suffered one too many times to count. Meanwhile, the Lightning Lane return times can be way more forgiving. Not only are you not gonna be charged any sort of late fee if you don't show up, but usually you can talk to the cast member at the front of the attraction and explain the situation and still be able to use your lightning lane even if it's a little bit past the return time you were originally given. And don't forget, you get a whole hour to return. It's also not a bad idea to keep checking back in on the lightning lanes available and see if you can modify your selection for a different time, if a new one that works better for you pops up. That way, you won't have to stress over these dueling reservations at all. All right, let's talk surge pricing. Surge pricing is popping up everywhere, right? Budgeting for a Disney World vacation has become even more complicated recently, but it can also work in your favor. So there's a little bit of a silver lining here. But let's start with a problem first, and that problem is prices that constantly change. Surge pricing is when a specific item, like a hotel or park ticket, doesn't stay the same price from day to day. It changes based on expected demand, and it becomes more expensive when the demand is high and cheaper when demand is low. Supply and demand, right? Basic economics. Or as Forky says, economics. While surge pricing isn't necessarily new to Disney World, some previously set prices have recently switched over to a more fluid price-based system. For example, example, Disney announced three new surge price systems this past year. The first is for that park-specific pricing for those one-day, one-park tickets, meaning Disney World tickets now not only vary in cost depending on when you visit, but also vary in cost depending on what park you want to visit on a specific day. Here's a look at the new price ranges for single-day park tickets. Remember, this is just single-day park tickets that are priced per park, not multi-day park tickets. Again, if you're planning on using a one-day park hopper, or if you're planning on getting tickets for more than one park a day, then this new surge system won't impact you all that much. But if you're just looking for a quick trip to say, Magic Kingdom and Magic Kingdom only, you're now not only gonna have to search for what dates are cheapest, but also when Magic Kingdom will be cheapest during the dates you wanna visit. Now, that's a lot to think about. Along with park-specific ticket pricing, Disney's also introduced surge pricing for ticket add-ons, like Park Hoppers and Park Hopper Plus. Originally, Park Hoppers used to cost a flat rate, 65 bucks on any given day. While Park Hopper Plus add-ons, which include an extra Disney activity, like one of the Disney water parks or golf courses, cost a flat rate of 85 but now these prices are less set in stone and more fluid as well. They now start at 65 but are subject to increase based on demand. And then there's Disney Genie Plus, which used to be a set rate of $15 per person per day. But last October, those set prices went out the window in exchange for surge prices. Now Genie Plus has the potential to get as high as $29 per person or even higher, though we haven't seen it yet. It might come down the pike, depending on the predicted crowd levels. And that's because demand for Genie Plus is getting higher and higher higher and higher. In fact, on February 18th this year, Genie Plus completely sold out for the first time ever in Disney World at their peak price of $29. And by the way, it has sold out in Disneyland before too. So if you're still out there wondering, will guests actually fork over hundreds of dollars for a previously free service? The answer is yes. Yes, they will. With all that being said, how can you make sure surge pricing plays toward your advantage instead of hindering you? This is that silver lining we were talking about. Well, you can usually get a pretty good idea of how surge pricing is gonna look for all aspects of your trip based on the regular park ticket calendar on the Disney World website. For example, let's take a look at the month of August in 2023. At the very beginning of the month, four-day ticket prices range between $131 and $134 per day, meaning Disney's still expecting the last bit of the summer vacation crowds to be around. So fluctuating prices could still be in the mid to high range. However, by the end of the month, you can tell the crowds will more than likely drop down after schools are back in session, since prices start to get as low as $114 per day. And that means more than likely all the other surge-based pricing for things like Genie Plus and Park hoppers and individual lightning lanes and hotels should also drop down too. So play around with your travel dates. Keep an eye on that surge pricing calendar online as well. You're going to be able to track this calendar down on the same page you'll go to when you're starting to look into actually buying your park tickets. Also keep in mind that some of these surge prices aren't required for you to buy whatsoever. 
Park Hopper, Genie Plus. They can be nice to have around, but if you're planning on taking a longer Disney World vacation, especially around a non-peak season like mid-January or September, you won't necessarily need these benefits to get everything done that you want to get done. If you can't plan your trip around a specific non-peak season though, which is fair, there's a reason why summer is so popular for so many families, then consider rope dropping the parks and staying later to get the most out of your park day. Maybe take a break in the middle of the day when the crowds are at their highest and then head back to the parks in the evening to take advantage of the lower temperatures and the lower wait times. All right, big question. Why are the crowds throughout the Disney World parks refusing to die down consistently? Well, in short, it's because there's always something going on. I mean, think about it. Even in those slower months like January and February, we have the Run Disney Marathon weekend, Valentine's Day weekend, President's Day weekend, Martin Luther King weekend, Princess Half Marathon. And on top of all that, these are some of the last few months you'll be able to experience not only the 50th anniversary celebration, which wraps up on March 31st, but also the two magic Kingdom and Epcot nighttime fireworks, Disney Enchantment and Harmonious. And then starting April 2nd, you'll have two returning shows to experience that the crowds are going to be stoked for. Happily Ever After comes back to Magic Kingdom and Epcot Forever to Epcot. And then you've got Tron Light Cycle Run opening for everyone on April 4th. More on this in just a second. And then you've got the Walt Disney Company's 100 year anniversary that guests are excited to celebrate inside the parks. Yeah, the list of reasons why we can't catch a break just keeps on keeping on. And of course, this is Disney's plan. They want to get people in the parks and keep them in the parks, right? And crowds in Disney go together like plastic cheese and corn dog nuggets. You just expect it at this point. That's why it's so important to pay attention to the Disney World events calendar when you're planning your future trip. This way you'll know exactly what specialty events, if any, will be taking place during your visit. Sometimes you can plan around where the thick of the Disney crowds are going to be. For instance, St. Patrick's Day is probably going to bring a lot of folks to the Disney Springs area. Specifically around Raglan Road, since it always holds a big St. Patty's Day party, you'll pay an extra price to experience. And when Magic Kingdom hits the ground running in April with their new show and ride, you may very well find the park crowds to be way more manageable at Disney's Hollywood Studios and Disney's Animal Kingdom. It's all about strategizing your plan of attack ahead of time. But what if you want to be in Magic Kingdom on April 4th? Well, you still can. Just brace yourself for the thick crowds and plan to take as many sit down breaks as you need to escape the masses. This may also be a good time to purchase Genie Plus, which you can do starting at midnight on the day of your visit. Oh, and don't forget to grab your park pass, those are selling out. Since a lot of Frontierland is under construction right now, since Splash Mountain is currently transforming into Tiana's Bayou Adventure, slated to open later in 2024, we do expect that area to remain pretty quiet for the time being. So head this way for a snack, a breather, maybe even a little trip over to Tom Sawyer's Island if you need some peace away from all those people. Looking for more crowd survival tips? Don't forget to check out our 50 ways to avoid the crowds video on our YouTube channel after this. Okay, remember when I mentioned eBay at the beginning of this video? Let's talk about that a little bit. Sometimes the huge problems that Disney experiences aren't strictly Disney's fault. Sometimes guests can ruin the party too, specifically speaking, when other people buy up all the new and exclusive merchandise before anyone else has a chance to even look at it. Let's backtrack to the beginning of Disney World's 50th anniversary, just so you can see how big of an issue this can truly become when it's at its worst. On October 1st, 2021, there were huge lines piling at the front gates before the park even opened. The Emporium saw huge lines just to get inside, and once you actually made it into the store, it was packed out with people standing shoulder to shoulder, grabbing whatever shiny 50th labeled merchandise they could get their hands on. Tensions rose due to the demand for merchandise, and a fight actually broke out inside the shop, which according to a cast member, resulted in security having to be called. There was more exclusive merchandise featured at Big Top Souvenirs in Fantasyland, but things weren't looking so hot in that direction either. The store used a virtual queue system, which was completely filled by 7.25 a.m., and this led to some rather angry guests, many of which were experiencing the parks for the first time ever. Not a great first impression. And what's even worse with all this hullabaloo is that several guests decide to buy up these items in bulk, not just to have, but to resell for way higher prices online. Disney is still working 
working to figure out ways to control this issue of limited supply and excess demand. Virtual queues for merchandise do tend to help, and Disney did implement a two specialty items per transaction limit on specific merchandise, which was stated as a way to manage limited supply during the pandemic. Many online sellers still find a way to get around this by getting back in line to do another transaction, which is even easier to manage if you're in a store that has mobile checkout on the My Disney Experience app. So let's say there's an item you're really wanting to get your hands on. Can you manage to do so without losing your cool in the process? The 50th anniversary illustration is a very drastic example of merchandise demand at its worst. But even with Epcot's 40th anniversary, we saw merchandise lines wrap around the park and peak at two plus hours long, which doesn't even begin to compete with the figment popcorn bucket fiasco of 2022, where we saw the crowds reach peak wait times of six hours to get a popcorn bucket. Six. What made matters worse is that several guests who waited in this forever long figment queue turned right back around and sold these buckets online for hundreds. One of the highest listings we found on eBay last year reached a whopping $270 with 55 bidders. This is usually a $25 popcorn bucket, my friends. 25 bucks. This year, it was sold in droves with plenty of buckets for everyone who wanted one. Just goes to show you how intense mob mentality and the desire to get the hottest limited item can really be. If owning a limited edition bag or shirt is that important to you, then the earlier you can get to the park and get in line, the better. If you see a limited edition item that you really like, but you don't know whether or not you should get it now or wait, I'd err on the side of get it now. Because if you want it later, it might not still be there when you return and you can always bring something back to a gift shop, but it may not be there if you go back to get it. And my best bit of advice for you, see if you can find these exclusive items on shopdisney.com instead. More and more products are being sold in the parks and on Shop Disney simultaneously, meaning you might not have to waste your whole park day just to get the latest spirit jersey. And if you can't make it to the parks and you can't get to the place where that thing's being sold, you have more of a chance to get it online without buying it from a reseller. Now let's talk about getting reservations for dining and what a nightmare it is these days. I will forever talk your ear off about advanced dining reservations and how extremely important they are if you're wanting to book a table at a restaurant like Cinderella's Royal Table in Magic Kingdom, Sci-Fi Dine-In at Disney's Hollywood Studios, and Space 220 at Epcot. But let me show you what this ADR process could wind up looking like for so many people. In order to call dibs on the ADRs, you'll need to wake up at around 5 a.m. Eastern to get on the Disney website or My Disney Experience app. That's because advanced dining reservations often start to go live around 5.30 at the earliest. Yep, my central time zone friends, this means you'll have to be up by 4. And for my Pacific and Mountain Time folks, just don't, don't go to sleep the night before, I guess. When the ADRs drop, you've got to act fast. But even getting up before the roosters do still sometimes isn't enough to beat all the other people who are also on the Disney website at the same time you are with the very same goal you have. And if you book a trip after that 60-day time frame, then you'll miss that initial 60-day advanced dining reservation drop altogether. When you're getting up at the crack of dawn and trying to get those coveted ADRs, you can improve your chances of securing your table in a few different ways. Strategy one. Break up those bigger groups. You're a lot more likely to secure two tables for two groups of four rather than one table for a single group of eight. Strategy two, search for a specific restaurant before that drop time and refresh the page when you're getting closer to the ADRs going live. And strategy three, search for non-popular dining times. Usually you'll find that the later breakfast time slots or mid-afternoon time slots between two and four have more availability than those peak lunch and dinner time frames. Now, if you're trying to book dining reservations after that 60-day drop, it never really hurts to go ahead and check on the Disney website anyway, just to see if any availability is still lingering about online. And keep checking on Disney World's website or the My Disney Experience app until the very last minute. Even the day of your visit, reservation times have the tendency to pop up out of the blue since people can make cancellations up to two hours before their reservation without having to pay that $10 per person penalty. Meaning cancellations do happen all the time and you might still be able to benefit from someone else changing their mind. You can find last minute availability for any of the park restaurants via the dining tips board on the app. You might also find last minute walk up wait lists here too. Whatever the case may be, even if you don't manage to get those super popular dining reservations like you would have hoped for, there are still plenty of restaurants you can turn to that'll get you fed and still provide you with that immersive Disney theming you were searching for. That's why we made that 2023 DFB Guide to Walt Disney World Dining book in the first place. 
to highlight just how many restaurants you could potentially experience while on property and show you the underrated restaurants that maybe don't sell out because not enough people know how incredible they are. If you want to check out an in-depth list of all the Disney World restaurants, hit up dfbstore.com and get your digital guide today. Make sure to type in the code YouTube for some extra savings. And by the way, remember, this is a 100% guaranteed book. We put all of our information in here, all of our experience, all of our knowledge. We think it's pretty great, but if you don't love it, just let us know and we'll refund your money immediately. Now, just to give you a few examples for which table service restaurants we tend to turn to the most frequently for a satisfying meal at the last second, Liberty Tree Tavern in Magic Kingdom. They've got that all-you-can-eat Thanksgiving meal in a restaurant themed after a late 18th century home. Delicious comfort food and learning. What can you say, by the way? If even Liberty Tree Tavern is full, you can look at Diamond Horseshoe. It's right next door. It has the same food. Yak and Yeti in Animal Kingdom has Asian fusion cuisine served in an incredible atmosphere. I absolutely love the decor in this place. Hollywood Brown Derby Lounge in Hollywood Studios, they're going to hook you up with select eats right from the signature Hollywood Brown Derby restaurant with all seating at first come first serve so nobody can get a reservation for this place so it's a great one if you're in the park and you're starving and you just want to eat somewhere and La Creperie de Paris in Epcot they serve dessert crepes and savory galettes all day long it's a brand new restaurant nobody seems to know about it so head on back there into the back of the France pavilion over by Remy's Ratatouille Adventure and you'll find it so the next big problem that Disney needs to fix is not that it's really hard to get on new rides, although that is kind of a stinker as well, but that virtual queues could keep you from riding rides at all. So Tron Light Cycle Run is getting ready to launch into the Magic Kingdom on April 4th. We've gotten to take a test run on it thanks to some of our cast member friends who invited us along with their previews, and we're already big fans of this high-speed race into the digital future. But what we're not fans of is the fact that lots of people who arrive for Tron's big release day may not get to experience it at all, and that's because there will be no physical standby queue for this roller coaster yet. Disney does this so that those lines on opening day don't overwhelm cast members and guests and the ride itself, since in the past, some guests have ended up waiting their entire park day just to ride a single new ride. So there are only two ways that you're going to be able to score a seat on Tron Light Cycle Run when it opens. First, you can get a boarding group on the My Disney Experience app to gain free access to the ride's virtual queue. Disney hasn't yet announced times for when those boarding passes will be available each day, but if past rides are any indication, they'll probably still happen around 7 a.m. and 1 p.m. The second way to get on this ride is by buying your way onto it. You can grab an individual Lightning Lane for Tron, which will cost you a fluctuating price per person per ride through. Spots for individual Lightning Lanes will open up every morning at 7 a.m. for hotel guests only. All other guests will have to wait to purchase theirs until the park opens, but more than likely they'll be sold out by then, at least for the first few weeks. Just being real with you. Now, I know many of you aren't going to want to opt to pay even more for a single ride on an attraction that's a little over a minute long, especially since we've seen individual Lightning Lanes get as high as $22 per person for other popular rides in the past. So let's just stick with the virtual queue advice for now. We've got a whole post about how to enter into these virtual queues on our DFB website, which I'll go ahead and link down below. But right now we're going to give you some pro tips. Pro tip number one, check your Wi-Fi connection. Sometimes the difference between getting in the virtual queue versus not getting in the virtual queue all boils down to how fast your internet speed is, since these virtual queues do tend to fill up really fast, almost as fast as a light cycle launch. And I'm not joking there, we're talking seconds. Next, test the Wi-Fi speed in your hotel ahead of time. That way you'll know if the current connection you have is gonna be good or if you're gonna need to go somewhere else with a better connection, like your hotel's lobby or a nearby Mickey D's. You may also wanna just rely on your phone's service if you have a pretty fast plan that you can lean on during these trying times because a lot of people in the same area are going to be trying to access that Wi-Fi at the same time. Pro tip two, confirm your party in advance. Beginning at 6 a.m., you can tap into the virtual queue and set up your group. That way you'll have fewer steps to deal with when boarding groups become available at 7 a.m. or 1 p.m. On the app under join virtual queue, you'll find a button that says confirm your party. Once you hit that button, the app will find the people 
people who are linked to your account and you can select each person that you want to add and then hit confirm party again and then you'll be good to go. Pro tip three, have a partner help you pull this off. Back when Cosmic Rewind first opened, we had family members wake up with us so that we could team up and conquer the virtual queue system together. The more people you have trying to grab a virtual queue, the better. And if one of you gets it, pulling the other one into their party, then you're not wasting virtual queue space. And brace yourself for glitches. I'm not saying my Disney experience will glitch on you, but it's not unheard of. If you happen to get into the virtual queue, take a screenshot of your boarding group number immediately. That way, if anything does happen to it, if it somehow floats off into the ether, you can take your concerns up with the park's guest services and show them photographic proof that something funky is going on with the app. It'll make their jobs easier and allow them to help you get things solved more quickly as well. The next big problem Disney needs to fix is that annual passes remain unavailable. Now, for those who love visiting Disney World multiple times a year, Disney's kind of cut them off in a sense. But in order to understand why, let's dip into Disney's first quarter earnings call for 2023. I know that sounds riveting, but I promise you it gets a little juicy here. Disney CEO Bob Iger noted during this call that he felt some of Disney's pricing strategies were starting to alienate people. Now, I can hear you nodding your head in agreement. Same. He then shared that Disney's taking some extra steps to change things with its pricing. But in order to change pricing, Iger said the company company needs to manage capacity very, very carefully. Iger continued by saying that some of the changes currently being made have enabled Disney to shift the mix from annual pass holders to people who may come to the parks just once in a lifetime. This starting to sound familiar to anyone else? If you've been keeping up with the Disney drama, then you might remember former CEO Bob Chapek saying the exact same thing. Chapek stated that someone who travels to Disney and stays for five to seven days is marginally more valuable to the business than someone who comes in on an annual pass. And that's because those with annual passes may stay a day or two and consume less merchandise and food and beverage. The battle between annual pass holders and Disney has been ongoing, and it all does boil back to managing capacity. More specifically, speaking, using the Park Pass reservation system to Disney's advantage at pass holders' expense. The Park Pass reservation system was originally put in place after the COVID-19 closures to keep the parks at a limited capacity for cast member and guest safety. But the Park Pass reservation system has lingered around long enough to see itself become the villain. Though Park Passes were only supposed to stick around for a limited time, Disney decided this system was much too valuable. It helped them not only see how many guests would be visiting the parks each day, but allowed them to block out certain types of guests from the parks when need be. And by certain guests, I mean us, pass holders. Pass holders who had paid for the highest tier passes with zero blockout dates could still technically be blocked out of the parks if their Park Pass reservation calendar claimed that all Park Passes had already been snatched up for the day they were wanting to visit. Come to find out, while pass holders were getting a big red X on certain days, guests purchasing single day tickets still seem to have the all clear. The Park Pass reservation system's limit on pass holder reservations wound up spurring lawsuits in both Disneyland and Disney World. But despite the controversies, Disney continued continues to assure guests that park pass reservations are a good thing, while also continuing to keep annual pass sales on pause for out-of-town guests until further notice. That's right, you cannot buy an annual pass unless you are a Florida resident. The three higher tier annual passes also remain unavailable for locals to purchase, with the only annual pass option available at the moment being the Pixie Dust Pass, which has the most blockout dates and the least amount of park pass reservations you can hold at a single time. Fortunately, Disney is still trying to find more ways to make their current annual pass holders happy since lawsuits and negative sentiment online cannot be good optics. One way Disney's planning to make things easier is by lifting the park pass reservation rule for all annual pass holders who visit after 2 p.m., the only exception being Magic Kingdom on the weekends, which pass holders still need to make reservations for. This is going to launch on April 18th, and for all you current pass holders out there, keep in mind that if you decide to renew your pass, you do have the option of renewing into a higher pass tier, even if they're not currently on sale for anyone else. There are four different pass tiers. There's the lowest and cheapest, the Pixie Dust Pass, then you've got the Pirate Pass, the Sorcerer Pass, and then finally the most expensive pass, the Increda Pass, which allows you to hold the most park pass reservations with no blockout dates, supposedly. So let's say you're currently holding a Pixie Dust Pass. When you get to your renewal window, you have the option to upgrade to a Pirate, Sorcerer, or and credit pass even though they're not available to purchase outright at the moment. You don't have to upgrade, but if you want to, you can. The Park Pass slash annual pass holder debacle is ongoing, but Iger says Disney will continue to look at opportunities to, quote, get more creative in terms of managing capacity. What this means for the future of annual pass holder sales is hard to say, but we will continue to keep y'all in the loop as we continue to learn more. 
Now, who knew that one of Disney's greatest perks could also be one of their greatest weaknesses, right? Disney helps guests get around property with free transportation services. You've got the Disney Skyliner, the monorails, the boats, the buses, but despite these services being complimentary and convenient, they can also be a thorn in your side when so many people are trying to board at the same time you are. For example, early theme park entry may sound great, but when you're staying at one of the all-star value resorts, which solely rely on the bus services to get around, lots of other people at your resort are gonna have the same idea as you. So you may think you're getting up and around early enough to get to, say, Magic Kingdom to fully take advantage of the extra 30 minutes of park time. But in reality, the bus stop may be packed out. And if you can't get on that first bus, you might have to wait several minutes before the next bus comes around. And that could throw off your whole entire early entry plan. And this isn't just a bus issue. This can be a problem for any of the transportation services, really. It's just more prominent with the buses. At the very end of a park day, crowds for almost all transportation services get wildly busy. I've even had multiple times where I had to wait for the Skyliner for 30 or more minutes just because those exiting park crowds can make the Skyliner queue incredibly long. Want to avoid the thick of the lines for Disney transportation? Give yourself more time than you think you're going to need just in case the lines are stupid busy. Also, check out when the next bus will be arriving to your resort via your handy dandy My Disney Experience app. If you go to your hotel reservation, you should find an option labeled Seed Bus Times. Tap on it and it'll show you a full list for when the next estimated bus arrival time will be for the parks or Disney Springs, as well as what your estimated arrival to said destination will be once you board. Now, if you're trying to make it to a dining reservation on time and you're nervous about having to rely on Disney transportation to get you there, you can always take your own car or use a premium rideshare service like Uber or Lyft. Minivans can also be purchased through the Lyft app, which will get you connected with Disney's own premium rideshare service. That's Mini with two ends. That can be super useful, especially if you're trying to get to Magic Kingdom in a jiffy. Unlike regular rideshares, which have to drop you off and pick you up over at the Transportation and Ticket Center, which in turn means you have to get a ferry or a monorail to get over to Magic Kingdom, the minivans can drop you off near to where the Disney buses drop guests off, the front gate. So no extra monorail or ferry ride necessary. Much like we talked about earlier, surge pricing definitely impacts ride shares too, but not by day, by sheer minutes. You'll see ride share prices spike upwards during premium travel times like lunch and rush hour. So if you're planning on ever using these services, make sure you've set aside a flexible budget specifically for speedy travel convenience. Now picture this, you're getting ready to wrap up a great day in the park. You rode a lot of fun rides, you saw a lot of great shows, but amidst all the hustle and bustle, you totally forget to grab something for dinner. So now what? Let's talk about late night dining. Fortunately, Disney does have some late night options still available. It's just that when you come to the end of your park day and you're starting to notice several restaurants closing up shop even before the parks do, you might have a moment of panic and think that you're gonna have to go to bed with zero sustenance. This is when a late night trip to Disney Springs can be just the solution you're looking for. Lots of Disney Springs restaurants stay open way later than other places. For example, the Daily Poutine, Earl of Sandwich, House of Blues, Jock Lindsay's Hangar Bar, The Boathouse, and several other Disney Springs favorites stay open until 11 p.m. and 11.30 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays sometimes. The Disney resorts also have later dining options, so if you're staying at a value resort like one of the All Stars or Pop Century or Art of Animation, you'll have food court dining until 11 p.m. But several of the other hotels also have food court-like dining that'll stay open a little later too, like Saturday. Sagula Floatworks and Food Factory at Disney's Port Orleans French Quarter, Centertown Market at Caribbean Beach, and El Mercado de Coronado at Disney's Coronado Springs. And don't forget, you're not limited to the Disney bubble. Nearby chain restaurants like Taco Bell, Wendy's, Mickey D's, you know, the usual fast food lineup, will stay open later for the postpart crowds. If you have your own vehicle, you can slip into the drive through and grab yourself a cheesy gordita crunch on the go, but you can also have this food delivered to your hotel with those food delivery apps like DoorDash or Grubhub or Uber Eats. You'll just have to pick up said food at Bell Services since they won't be able to deliver it directly to your room. One more fail-proof solution, bring snacks from home. If you have hearty snacks like bagels and cream cheese, ramen, trail mix, cheese and meat snack packs stocked in your hotel room beforehand, then you'll not only guarantee a late night meal without having to go anywhere else, but you'll be able to save your money too. So listen, be wary of the way Disney words things because what Disney considers to be a steal of a deal can still end up being a very pricey endeavor for you. The cheapest rooms you're gonna find on Disney property are those standard value rooms, which will sleep up to four guests. But even the cheapest Disney rooms can still be $200 per night during those peak season times. 
And for what? Yeah, you get to be surrounded by tons of in-your-face Disney decor, and you'll be right there in the Disney bubble with access to complimentary transportation and the early theme park hours benefits. But at the end of the day, the hotel room you're going back to is just your average Joe Schmo hotel room. No bells or whistles, just two queen beds, a TV, and a bathroom area, plus a couple of extra amenities like a mini fridge and a coffee pot. And if you want to book a family suite at either All Star Music or Art of Animation for some more wiggle room, Prices are going to wind up ranging between 400 and 700 plus per night. If you book a family suite at Art of Animation Resort, expect the higher end of this suite pricing because spending the night with characters from The Lion King and Finding Nemo or Cars won't come cheap, plus you have access to the Skyliner. What I'm trying to say is, don't book a room at one of Disney's value resorts thinking that it's going to be your only semi-affordable option. You can also look into good neighbor hotels, which can be even cheaper and potentially more spacious than a Disney value resort stay. For example, B Resort and Spa Lake Buena Vista rooms, they start at $127 per night, and you can take advantage of early theme park entry there too, like you can with a handful of other good neighbor hotel options. B Resort has free transportation to the parks and select rooms with fireworks views. The Doubletree Suites by Hilton start at $109 per night and only offer one and two bedroom suites, making it a good option for bigger groups or just families who need extra space. And the brand new Drury Plaza near Disney Springs, they have rooms that can be less than $200 per night, though you'll mostly find rooms ranging between $200 and $300. But with that price tag, you're not only getting some of those Disney perks like early theme park entry, but you'll also be getting daily complimentary breakfast and a 5.30 kickback with free evening snacks and drinks. Even with all these good neighbor savings, there is still something to be said about staying directly with Disney. Not only do you get to stay immersed in the Disney bubble your whole trip long, but transportation offerings can be more convenient too. I mean, if you stay over at Pop Century or Art of Animation, you're right there on the Skyliner route, meaning you'll have direct access to Epcot and Hollywood Studios at all times. So if you don't mind paying a little extra to stick it out with a Disney value resort, check the special offers, deals, and discounts page on the Disney World website and see if there are any limited time savings opportunities for your vacation's time frame. And remember, Disney Hotels follow that surge pricing compass. So if you just want to find a better deal on your room, you'll want to plan your visit at just the right time. And I'm not just talking about planning a trip during off season. I'm talking about vacationing on the weekdays versus the weekends. Because if you check this out real quick, if I decide I want to stay in a standard pop century room for four nights in June with my family of four, two adults, two kids, and I check in on a Monday, June 5th, I'll be paying around $179 per night. But if I wait to check in on a Friday, June 9th, I'll have to pay around $194 per night. So I could save $15 bucks a night just because I moved my trip up by a few days. So play around with those vacation dates before you book a room and see what options will give you the least expensive stay. And speaking of Disney hotels, uh, let's talk about those missing perks. Since the historic 2020 closures, we have yet to see some of our favorite hotel benefits return to the resort scene. A big example is that merchandise delivery, and we talk about it every once in a while here on the channel. Once upon a time, you could purchase a souvenir inside the Disney parks and have it delivered back to your Disney resort. That way, you wouldn't have to worry about carrying it around all day long. But when the hotels started to reopen, merchandise delivery did not come back. Same thing goes for in-room dining. Before COVID closures, you could call for room service and have Disney food delivered right up to where you were staying. But the only hotel that's currently offering in-room dining at the moment is Disney's Grand Floridian Resort and Spa. So unless you're planning on spending a pretty penny to stay here, no in-room Disney dining for you. Now, these services could very well return in the near future. They're starting to return in Disneyland after all. And we've seen the full comeback of housekeeping services and free parking for Disney Resort guests. But if you're planning on staying in a Disney Resort soon, you're not going to have these conveniences to rely on. I know I already recommended food delivery services either, but they're still a solid alternative to that long lost in-room dining perk, at least for the time being. Grocery delivery apps like Instacart can also help bring fresh foods to your hotel that you can pick up at Bell Services. And this can be even more convenient if you're staying in a suite with a partial or full kitchen. That way you can prepare your own meals right there in the comfort of your room. As far as merchandise delivery is concerned, wait to purchase bigger souvenir items until the end of the day if you can, unless of course it's one of those limited release items we talked about earlier. Then you might benefit from bringing your own car just so you can drop off merch in your trunk instead of having to backtrack all the way back to your hotel room. You can also have souvenir items mailed home to you if you'd prefer. 
Any Disney World gift store will be able to mail your purchases back to your house. Same goes with any Disney World hotel that has a convention or business center. You will have to pay for standard shipping and handling rates, but if you are planning on buying some bigger items that you don't necessarily want to lug around in your park bag or travel home with for that matter, this could be the next best solution. You can also store those big purchases in a park locker if you don't mind spending a little extra to get one. Lockers are located at the front of the parks and cost 10 to $15 per day depending on the size you choose. To purchase one, you'll just need to use the self-service kiosk inside the locker area, or if you want to pay with your magic band, you'll just head to the nearest merchandise location to ask for assistance. And once again, don't forget about your good old friend Shop Disney. Before you buy that super cute Disney playset or those Mickey-shaped kitchen utensils, make sure Shop Disney isn't already selling it on their website, because if they are, you can just order it online instead, and often for a cheaper price if the website's having one of their many online-only sales. So Disney World can be an absolute dream come true for you and your family, but ignorance towards Disney's major problems does not lead to bliss. Stay alert and familiarize yourself with those potential vacation setbacks, and that's why you're here, we're gonna help you with that, and be ready to avoid them and attack them head on. Because when you do, and you do it successfully, you're gonna have a great trip ahead of you, no matter what gets thrown your way. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.